We are interviewing Bill Braden today, December 10th, 2007, in Voorheesville, New York, at 2.30 in the afternoon. He served in the United States Army from March 4th, 1944 to May 17th, 1946. This interview is conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. Please tell us your full name and when and where you were born. William Christian Braden, born in Albany, New York. And will you tell us what did you do before you entered the service? Graduated from high school when I was just 17 and had a job in the Voorheesville Army Depot. And at the Voorheesville Army Depot, I started as a laborer. And the job was to lift heavy equipment with a crane and put it on railroad cars and take it to ports where it eventually went overseas to supply the Army and the Navy. And of course, we had trains coming in that we unloaded and we had trains going out. And that uh, was kind of the background that helped me get the job that I got when I went into the Army. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted, but uh, I had an uh, exemption for working out at the Army Depot because we were vital to the war effort. And my father said to me one time, Bill, I went in the Army, you thinking of going in? And I guess I felt a little guilty. Oh, I didn't really want to go in the Army, so I tried to enlist in the Naval Air Force. And the Naval Air Force at that time would send kids to college for three or four years, and then you would get the Air Force training and become a pilot. I had a heart murmur past the uh, intelligence test, but the heart murmur kept me out of the Naval Air Force. So I went back to work at Voorheesville for a few months, <clears throat> and then I volunteered to go in the draft. I think it was my father's urging that made me do that. Did you regret ever doing that? No, I didn't regret it at all because I was a kid. By that time, I was a kid, 18 years old. I had no realization that uh, I would ever get shot at. I had no realization that I could get killed. It was another adventure in the life of a young boy. I remember the day I left, uh, I had already been examined and accepted in the Army. And my mother was sick in bed with a gallbladder attack. And I said to my mother goodbye and gave her a kiss and shook hands with my father and went out and stood on the corner and waited for the bus to come along in Albany. Got on the bus, didn't really think I was doing anything, maybe going to the movies or something. Went downtown Albany and uh, met with a bunch of other fellows. And we got on the train and away we went to Fort Dix. Did you have any kind of uh, interview or processing at, in Albany? Was it at the old post office? It was at the old post office. I don't remember very much of what happened there. <clears throat> I do remember an interesting thing that happened when I got to Fort Dix. We were in Fort Dix about two weeks waiting to get assigned to our regular duties. And uh, one day they sent for me to report to the health office. I reported to the health office, and now here I'm, a, I'm an 18-year-old kid. And at the health office, they said to me, you're going to be checking hearing today. And I said, uh, what? They said, you're going to be checking the hearing of people who are coming in to be examined in this area. I said, OK. So they put me in a long hallway and they gave me a chair to sit in. I sat down in that chair and they said, now the people whom you're going to be testing will be coming in the other end of the hallway. And you just whisper three or four words or three or four numbers and they have to repeat it. And then you either pass them or you fail them. So the first fellow came in, I said, 46. He said, 46. 
53, 53, 99, 99, okay, you're past. And uh, after I was doing that for about an hour, a fellow came in, I said, 43, and he said, pardon? I said, 43, he said, I can't hear you. I said, 43, and he said, I, I said, as long as I was in that army, he wasn't going to get denied an opportunity to come in because he couldn't hear me. So that was rather a funny experience for an 18-year-old kid to start out. And then I had KP, and we had an interesting experience in KP. We were making mashed potatoes for supper, and they had a great big metal container with potatoes that had been boiled, and we came with a big mixer to mash the potatoes. And the fellow who was running the mixer started out slowly and it was going very nicely and then if this was another KP, all of a sudden he turned it on full speed. And when he turned it on full speed, centrifugal force took over and the potatoes flew out of the big bowl and went in a circle all the way around on the outside. And the mess sergeant came along and called the guy a few names that are not anything that we will publish here but uh, the fellow said well what will I do and he said well go out and get a shovel and put them back in there he said we've got to have them for supper <laughs> so the fellow went out and got a shovel and he came in shoveled up the potatoes put them back in there and they put them up on the mess line and somebody came through and they said uh, there seems to be black spots in the potatoes what's the trouble and the mess sergeant said, we put too much pepper in them, just don't pay any attention to it. So that was uh, my experience in Fort Dix. I bet you didn't eat any of those potatoes. I ate no potatoes. <laughs> so then from Fort Dix, uh, I was sent to the New Orleans Army Air Force Base, which was a very small base that nobody ever heard of. And that's where we started our basic training. And because of my experience out at the Voorheesville Army Depot, I had been assigned to a crane out there. And I knew a lot about cranes and crane lifting, and I had actually run the crane out there. So my uh, MOS, I think is what they called it, my MOS number was for an engineer. And for those that don't know what MOS means, Military Occupational Skill. Oh, I, I wouldn't even have remembered that myself. So uh, we went down there to New Orleans and I was assigned to the 360th Harbourcraft Company. And that was rather mysterious because whoever heard of a Harbourcraft Company that wasn't part of the Navy, but it wasn't. And I was in the 360th uh, Harbourcraft Company for uh, seven or eight weeks. And we had a wonderful group of officers, really classy people. And there were about 200 of us in this company. And we were all recruits. And the officers, and there were a couple of sergeants who had been assigned, but other than that, we were all recruits. So one day the chief executive officer or the company commander, I guess we would call him, said, uh, do any of you boys know how to do a uh, drill? And I had been in the Boy Scouts and I knew drill and I said yes. And he said, come up here and show me a few things. Well, I went up there and <clears throat> he took eight boys out of the line and he put eight boys up there and he said, put them through the drill. So I, uh, I drilled them, tension, at ease, uh, forward march, left flank, right flank to the rear march. And he said, okay, you're all right. He said, you're going to be an acting corporal. So I was an acting corporal after I was in the service for about six weeks. And uh, about, we went out and we did the short arm drill, with, short order drill with the, uh, with the guys in the service. And, 
It worked out well, and a week later they gave me my stripes. I was a corporal after I'd been in the Army for about two months. Well, that was fine, except that a week later they decided to break up our 360th Harbourcraft Company. And they sent me to a new company, which was the 362nd Harbourcraft Company. And the 362nd Harbourcraft Company had a full unit of men, which probably was 250 or 270 men. And we went over there, and the day we went over, it was pouring rain, I remember this, and uh, there were floods, and we were walking through the water, carrying all of our gear, went over to the new company, and they called for an assembly, and we all went out, and we stood out in the rain, and the, the captain came up to me, and he said, uh, Soldier, what did you do to get those stripes? He could see I was a young 18-year-old kid. What did you do to get those stripes? And uh, I was so flabbergasted, I said, I don't know, sir, and gave him a big salute. And he said, well, you better find out in a hurry how you got those stripes. And uh, there were four of us who had gone over from the other company, and he asked the same question of all four of us, how did you get the stripes? The other guys gave a more intelligent answer than I did. But we were doomed from the day we went into that company because they had acting corporals in charge of their squads whom they had already named, but they had not given them any stripes. So I am now in a squad with my corporal stripes being led by an acting corporal who had no stripes. Now I was about as popular as a cat in a birdcage those days. And that was uh, a disaster for us, except that in the long run it turned out to be really well because the boys in the 360th Harbourcraft Company got moved over to Calais in France and 70% of them got killed. And being in the other, har the new Harbourcraft Company, we went to the Pacific and I don't think anyone in our outfit ever got killed. So we were very fortunate Unfortunate at the time, but fortunate later on. And the, the officers and the uh, non-commissioned officers in this 362nd Harbourcraft Company had it in for uh, the four of us who had our corporal stripes, and, and we had a miserable time in that outfit. <coughs> After a while, we got transferred to Camp Gordon Johnston, Florida, which was on the Gulf Coast in a little town called Carabella. And it was a beautiful place, and you could go right down, just walk from the company street right down, and you were right on the Gulf of Mexico, and looking out and see the ocean and the nice sandy beach, and it was just a beautiful spot, but we were in basic training again. And the thing I remember about that basic training, we, uh, we used to go out on Sunday afternoon hunting rattlesnakes because we were in kind of a very sandy place where it was like desert-like and the rattlesnakes used to come out on the, in the afternoon and bask in the sun <clears throat> and we went out there, a bunch of 18-year-old kids not knowing any better because there were no rattlesnakes in Albany, go out there hunting rattlesnakes until we saw one one day that some other people had that was about six feet long and we decided that that rattlesnake was all we wanted to see we didn't want to be anything near it <clears throat> so that was the end of the rattlesnake hunt and one day they posted my name up on the bulletin board to report to headquarters and I reported to headquarters and when I got to headquarters early in the morning, they said, you're going to guard Prescott. Well, Prescott was a fellow in our outfit who had been in the Merchant Marine. And if you were in the Merchant Marine and you came back on leave and did not report back to the Merchant Marine within 30 days, you became draft eligible. And he went back 
to Maine, where he came from, overstayed his 30 days, got drafted. Well, he didn't want any part of the Army. He wanted to be in the Merchant Marine, but he had missed this opportunity. And he was a troublemaker from the word go. He, uh, he drank and uh, he got mad and he tipped over a stove that was lighted and set fire to uh, the floor of a barracks and he got put in the brig. But they didn't want him to just sit in the brig. They wanted him to take the same training that the rest of us took. So my job was to guard him. So I went down to the brig and the person in charge of the brig came out and handed me a revolver and uh, <clears throat> a belt to carry the revolver <clears throat> and a handful of uh, bullets. I'm still only 18 years old, maybe 19 by this time. And I said, uh, sir, would you show me how to load this gun? I've never had one of these before. He said, you're going to guard that troublemaker today? And I said, that's what they tell me. So this fellow loaded up the gun for me, and I said, well, show me how to shoot it. <laughs> so he, uh, he went out and he showed me how to take the safety off and how to shoot the gun. And he said, well, you won't have any trouble because you're on the base and he can't really get away any place. He can't get off the base because the base was all enclosed. Well, wouldn't you know, that day our company decided that they were going to go on some kind of a field trip off the base. So after lunch, we all had, uh, had to get together and they marched us all off the base. And we were going to have maneuvers. And they divided us up into two groups, the reds and the whites. And when we walked out past that gate, my heart started to thump because I'm walking alongside of this guy and he's about six foot four and he weighs about 220 pounds. He had been in the Merchant Marine. He was in his 30s. He was a, a mature man. And I just didn't want to have to tangle with him in any way, shape or matter. So they divided us up into two groups and the red people were up on top of the hill and the white people were down at the bottom of the hill and we had to defend ourselves against the other fellow. So, uh, I said to this Prescott, all right, you've got to dig a foxhole because that's what they told us to do. And uh, we had these uh, little collapsible shovels. And uh, he said, I'm not digging any foxhole. I said, this is an order, dig that foxhole. He told me where I could go. Well, I wasn't going to shoot him in the first place. I didn't even know how to shoot him if I knew if I wanted to, and I certainly didn't want to shoot the fellow out here. So we just sat behind a tree while all the maneuvers were going on. And he said, uh, let me take that shovel. I said, no, I'm not going to take that shovel. He said, you better not give me that shovel. I'll split your head open with it. I said, you split my head open with it. Before you split my head open, you'll have six bullets in you. So this is going on, and he is testing me for about two hours while we're out on this field maneuver. Well, it turned out all right, and we marched back in, and I sent, brought him back to the brig and turned him in and turned in my revolver, but it was one of the scariest days I really ever had in my life. It turned out to be a scarier day than I had when I got overseas and where the battles were going on. But that was a, a funny experience, something that you never would be prepared for. After Camp Gordon Johnston, we, uh, we were shipped out on a troop train to the west coast to a place near San Francisco. We were going to be going over to the Pacific. And they loaded us on the ship, and the ship was a terrible ship. It was a converted freighter and had no preparation for troops. It had been made over into a troop carrier simply by putting up a bunch of racks of bunks, uh, pipe-type bunks, down in the holds. And uh, the, the latrines were, were few and far between. It was a, a terrible place to be. 
and they had made a, a mess hall out of uh, some area that they had. So I was sure that I wanted to see the Golden Gate Bridge when we sailed out of San Francisco Harbor. I'd always heard about how beautiful the Golden Gate Bridge was. And we went out at night and I stood up on the deck and we got there and I could see the Golden Gate Bridge way, way far in the distance. That harbor must be a very deep harbor. <clears throat> well, we started to go and we got a little ways out and that ship started to, to rock with the swells and I never saw the Golden Gate Bridge because I got too sick before I could see the Golden Gate Bridge. It was way, way off in the distance. So I um, went downstairs and got in my sack and then the next day we had an abandoned ship drill and we had two fellows who were down in this hold where we were staying. We had two fellows who were so sick that the captain came down and said, this is an abandoned ship drill. You have to go upstairs with your life jacket on and get on the top deck. And they said, Captain, I don't care if this ship sinks or not. I'm not moving out of this bunk. They were so sick. Well, I dragged myself up to the top deck. And after four days, the sickness was gone. But when we got out into the, the South Pacific going west, the heat started to come, and it was just unbelievably hot. You could not stay down in the hold. So three other fellows and I who palled around together took our blankets took, and we laid out a spot on the deck that was behind the, what they call a forecastle on the ship, which is some kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, but it, it cast a shadow. And we put our blankets down the shadow, and I think we were 21 days out on the ocean. And during that whole time, we never left that spot unguarded. One person had to always stay and guard that spot because there were so many soldiers on board and there wasn't enough space on top of the deck for everybody to go. But um, we were there and it was, uh, it was terribly hot even on the deck. <clears throat> the main thing that was going on throughout the whole time was a, a huge crap game <laughs> was going on. And that, uh, fortunately, I didn't get involved in that and, and the three friends of mine, we didn't get involved in that. I think we only made $21 a month, so you didn't have a lot of money to gamble. And I was sending money home to my mother and father, so I don't even know how much money I had, but I didn't have any money to spend gambling, and I, I wasn't a gambler anyway. <clears throat> but the, uh, the, the crap game went on from the time we left San Francisco Harbor until we got to New Guinea, which was our, our stop. We stopped in a place called Finchhofen in New Guinea, stayed there for a, a day or two for, I don't know for what reason. And then we went from there to Hollandia, which is a big port in New Guinea. And the port was guarded by minefields that were that brought across the edge of the harbor. And when a ship was coming in, they would open those minefields because they didn't want the ship running into the minefields. We went through there into the harbor and there was an ammunition ship that was anchored there. An ammunition ship was one that carried all the ammunition that was on its way to the Philippines, but it was temporarily in Hollandia Harbor. And in total there were about 25 ships sitting in this harbor, big, big harbor, and all anchored. Uh, we went to bed that night and we were lying on this, uh, I say bed, it was top of the deck with a blanket on it that's where we slept. In the morning we heard a terrific explosion that was beyond understanding, it was so loud. And we jumped up and we looked out and there was a cascade of water that was at least a hundred feet in the air. 
and we thought for sure that the ammunition ship had blown up because it was anchored over to the side of us. <clears throat> the next thing we know, another huge explosion, and we looked up on the shore, and all we could see was water and sand and palm trees flying up in the air. What happened was that a two-man Japanese suicide submarine had followed us in through the minefield before they had gotten it closed back up. And they sat there all night waiting for morning. And they were after this ammunition ship. Somehow or other, they knew the ammunition ship was there. And they fired four torpedoes. And the one torpedo hit between us and the ammunition ship. And what it hit was floating barrels of airplane fuel that had been thrown overboard from one of the ships, a supply ship, waiting for the tide to come in to have them float up to the shore. It was the easiest way to get a couple hundred barrels of uh, fuel on the shore for the airport that was there. What had happened, one of these torpedoes hit a whole mass of that floating oil fuel and blew up and that's what we saw that was the first torpedo <clears throat> the other three torpedoes all hit the land and all we could see was flying sand and flying uh, debris of all sort and immediately our air force was out there dropping depth charges and I suspect that was the end of the, the Japanese sub but it was an extremely scary situation <clears throat> and this explosion that took off, that took place between us and the ammunition ship somehow or other loosened 29 plates on our ship. 29 plates that had been, uh, I imagine, welded onto the ship <clears throat> and it, the concussion blew them apart. So we had to stay in New Guinea. We were supposed to be going directly to the Philippine Islands. So we had to stay in New Guinea, and the ship eventually had to be sent to Australia to be repaired. So we uh, had to unload everything that was on the ship. And we had all of our supplies that were going to go with us up to the Philippines. <clears throat> and the first night, that, that we started to unload. This business with the uh, submarines was in the morning. We immediately started to unload the ship. And that evening, we uh, got on board LCMs, which were landing craft. Mechanized? Mechanized. Uh, they were a, something that could go up on a beach. They, had, they were built so that they could go up on a beach, and they loaded us all on these and took us up into the back end of this harbor and took us up on the beach as far as they could take us, ran up in there. <clears throat> we had to work in the dark because the Japanese were up in the, uh, the jungles here. And we uh, had a place where we were going to go and set up our camp for a temporary part of the time. Some funny experiences, I was about six feet tall and I stepped off the end of the LCM and I stepped into the water up to my waist. But the poor little guys, when they stepped off the end of that thing, they were almost under the water. And they're trying to hold their rifle, of course we're carrying a rifle, they're trying to hold their rifle up so the rifle wouldn't get wet. <coughs> When we finally got on shore, it was very, very scary. Uh, again, most of us were young. Being 18 years old, we're in a jungle, no lights, trying to find a place to, uh, to camp. So the four of us who were buddies decided that for protection purposes, we would put our two pup tents together. So we put our two pup tents together end to end, and we slept feet to feet. And in the middle of the night, one of our friends started, well, we also had to put on a mosquito netting because you, 
the place was full of malaria, mosquitoes, and dinghy fever, mosquitoes, and goodness knows what else. <clears throat> In the middle of the night, a salamander was walking across the, ch the chest that, of, uh, of one of my colleagues who was sleeping there. And it scared him so that he started to thrash around and he knocked the tent pole down and the tent collapsed on top of us and we thought we were being attacked by the Japanese. And he's screaming at the top of his lungs and somebody put on a flashlight and he's got a salamander that's about a foot long caught in the hair of his <laughs> chest. <laughs> and uh, you know we weren't scared enough at that point. I remember we said, we all had knives, and we slept with the knives under our pillows. No, we didn't have pillows. What am I talking about? We, whatever we had under our head, we had that knife under there to protect ourselves. This guy's got his knife out, and uh, the salamander was climbing in his hair. He had gotten under the, the mosquito bar and was in there. So that was quite, a, that was our first experience. That was uh, quite an experience. We, uh, we had a lot of adventures in, uh, in New Guinea, most of them uh, very unusual. There were Japanese up behind us that we knew about, and we sent guards out. And in the course of the first couple of nights when everybody was scared to death, the guards shot six of the goats that belonged to the, to the natives, killed two natives, and uh, we were then afraid of the natives because we had killed two of their people. We had a huge uh, python under the floor of the, the mess tent, and they had a lot of fun getting him out from under there. And we had uh, a beer ration that was uh, on, on a ship that came into the harbor and they came out and they rationed out the beer, gave us each a half a case of beer, I think it was. Well, I didn't drink, so I traded my beer to one of the beer drinkers for something else. I don't know what it was, maybe a candy bar or something of that sort. But uh, the officers in our company got very angry because the boys who were distributing the beer gave more beer to the enlisted men than they gave to the officers. So the officers came down and got, the, uh, got our first sergeant to go around. He made everybody bring out his beer and put the beer down on the company street, which was no street, it's a jungle, and put the beer down and the first sergeant went around with an ax and axed every can of beer. So that made the enlisted men so mad that in the middle of the night, when everybody was quiet, somebody went out with his rifle and shot about six rounds of his rifle through the top of the officer's tent <laughs> to, sh to show them that, that the enlisted men weren't very happy. Well, the next thing that happened is all of our equipment all kinds of trucks and gear and tents and um, stoves and everything that you'd have to have to keep a company going that had been on that ship had been unloaded and left on the dock of the uh, the place where we were where we had unloaded. Our guys went down to pick it up. There wasn't a thing there. This was a case of every man for himself and some other company came and actually stole all of our gear, every single piece of our gear. So we had nothing except what we brought with us, which was some kind of sea ration and we had our pup tents and we had a blanket, whatever you could carry, but there was nothing. Um, when I said that we had a python under the orderly tent, that was somewhat later. I skipped the spot here. Right now this is early on when we have no gear. So our company commander 
in his great wisdom, gathered together some people in our company who were known thieves. And, uh, you know, back in the time when they uh, brought people into the service, it didn't matter whether you had a good reputation or not, they needed you in the army. And so uh, he sent them down to the dock. So these guys went down to the dock and they waited until the next ship came in and that company was unloading their gear and that gear became our gear. So all of our thieves came back but unfortunately what they had taken was from a signal corps company and we were a harbor craft company and the gear for a harbor craft company was not the same as for a signal corps company. So we had trucks and we had enough wire on the back of the trucks to go from New Guinea to San Francisco and back again. And some poor signal company that needed the gear, had no gear, it was up in the jungle where we were. And uh, I don't know how we ever won the war with the way things were going on. And among things that, uh, that we had in some of these trucks that the guys had stolen, there were bazookas and bazooka ammunition. Well, our fellows in their great wisdom were out with the bazookas shooting coconuts out of the coconut trees with the bazookas that were supposed to be with the, the signal corps. So that was, that was quite an adventure. At the time that we were in New Guinea, I was assigned to a floating crane or derrick, which was a huge piece of equipment. The derrick itself sat and was fastened to a barge which was 140 feet long and about 40 feet wide and it sat in the middle of this. The boom on this derrick weighed 30 tons so it was a huge huge piece of equipment. It had a great big caterpillar six-cylinder caterpillar engine that ran it and I was assigned to that because I had the background of having worked on cranes in the Voorheesville Depot when I was a kid. Well, that was a good assignment. That was better than to be assigned a, a gun and go out and shoot somebody and try, uh, try to duck the bullets. So uh, we're ready to ship out, and I got sick. And I had diarrhea for a couple of days, reported to the local place where they had uh, some medical staff. And there was a field hospital there, and they put me in the field hospital. And it was determined after all kinds of tests and after a while that I had bacillary dysentery. And I found out that the reason I had bacillary dysentery was all of our water was taken out of a creek that came down from the mountains and the water was put into a big Lister bag. A Lister bag, for those who would not know what it was, was a big, big canvas bag that would hold maybe uh, 50 gallons of water. And the man who was in charge of getting the water out of the creek and into the Lister bag was supposed to put a capsule of iodine in the water which would make it potable. And the water tasted terrible when you put the iodine in and he decided that he didn't want to put the iodine in because it tasted so bad so he didn't put the iodine in and so several of us ended up with bacillary dysentery because there were bacilli in this water coming down out of the mountains. Don't know what put it there but animals and natives and I was in the hospital there for six weeks. I was very fortunate to have an outstanding army physician, a fellow from Chicago. And it was back in the days before penicillin, or maybe penicillin was just coming in, but there were sulfur drugs. And he loaded me up with sulfur drugs. And I recovered. But it was a bad experience because we were all in one big tent. Maybe uh, all, all the sick people in the area were all in one big tent. 
So it'd be maybe 50 people on one side of the tent and 50 people on the other, and every morning somebody was dead and they were carrying them out, and you, you had to see them because everybody was with invisibility. Well, that was a bad experience, but I came out of there, and then uh, it was time for us to, uh, to ship out. We didn't know where we were going to go, but we had quarters that was built on the top of this crane. This crane was big enough so that the roof of the crane could hold 14 of us. We had bunks up there, uh, one person on top of another, and seven sets of bunks. There were 14 of us who were assigned to this crane, and we were up there. They hooked us up to a tugboat, a seagoing tugboat, and the seagoing tugboat was going to tow us up to the Philippine Islands where they needed us because a ship did not have heavy enough gear to lift big tanks and big bulldozers. The only thing that could lift the big tanks and the big bulldozers was this crane of ours. And there were about 10 of them in the South Pacific in various places that were very important in these big ports because that was the only way they could unload the ships. So they were taking us, this crane had come from Australia. It was an American crane, but it had come from Australia. And so we were on board that uh, crane for about uh, 25 days going up to the Philippines. And it was a very interesting trip because there was this seagoing tugboat with two great big inch and a half cables coming back towing our barge. Two more sets of cables going from our barge to another barge that was back further. And the whole thing from the up where the uh, seagoing tug was to the last barge was maybe five miles long. And there was a whole convoy, about 10 seagoing tugs. Every place you looked, all you could see were seagoing tugs and barges. And the whole convoy was going up to the Philippine Islands. And we had destroyers and destroyer escorts going around the outside of this convoy constantly. We had air power overhead the whole time from New Guinea up there. But it was an unbelievably, uh, unfor it was not unfortunate, but it was just lucky that, that we didn't have a disaster because this barge that the crane sat on had no railings and we're out in the Pacific Ocean. And this barge did not have a uh, a bow that, that came together in a point. The bow was flat so that you bounced something awful out in the ocean. I was seasick again for three or four days. But uh, bathroom facilities were over the edge of the barge. And why somebody didn't fall in, nobody can understand. Before we... <laughs> Before we left New Guinea, a Navy boat came in, a Navy ship came in, and our guys uh, got a hold of the, the sailors on board, and somehow or other they did some trading, and I don't know what they uh, traded for, but they came up and they had a case of cherries. And they, uh, with the case of cherries, they also finagled a whole bunch of sugar and a little and a box of malt and they got a hold of a 25 gallon uh, glass container that at one time had had acid in and they took all the acid out and cleaned this thing up very well and so before we left New Guinea we had cherries sugar and malt and water filled up in this thing and they had it down in the engine room where it was nice and warm 
and the darn thing started to ferment. And every day they'd go down and they would check it to see how it was coming. Well, after four days or five days, they decided it had come as far as it was going to come. And we had the worst bunch of drunken soldiers on board that barge that you ever saw in your life. And they, I, I guess it was cherry, uh, what would it be? Cherry rum, cherry wine, cherry something or other. I'm not a drinker, so I don't know what was going on. But uh, they, they had a great time with this. And we, as I say, we had 14 people on board here. And why somebody didn't fall overboard, I'll never know. But the interesting thing is, they towed us into Manila Harbor. We were about 20 feet from the dock in Manila Harbor, and one of the fellas fell overboard. And that was a real funny experience, because he's down there thrashing around in the water in Manila Harbor, and some other guy comes up and grabbed a hold of a hawser, which, for those of you who don't know, is a great big rope about two inches in diameter. And he picked up this hawser and he throws the hawser in. Well, the hawser weighed about 20 pounds to an inch because it was a great big thing. And the poor drowning guy is trying to get a hold of the hawser and the hawser is sinking. And finally we got a little rope out to him and we got him on board. But if that had happened out in the middle of the ocean, he would have been gone because, believe it or not, we had no communication, no communication whatsoever with the seagoing tug, except if somebody knew Morse code with a flashlight. And nobody on board knew Morse, knew Morse code. There were no sailors on this thing. We were all soldiers. So we had no communication, and that seagoing tug was uh, at least a quarter of a mile ahead of us with these big long lines. If anybody fell overboard, they would have been gone completely. Furthermore, even if you could communicate to the seagoing tug, it couldn't stop because it's pulling about five barges along there. Well, we got in Manila. And, no, I'm sorry. I, uh, that happened in Manila, but I'm getting ahead of my story. Before we got to Manila, we pulled in a place called Tacloban, which was in Leyte, in the Philippine Islands. And as I was saying before, these cranes were very, very vital to the war effort because they were the only things that could lift these huge things like tanks and bulldozers out of the holds of the ship. We got into Lady, and we had no experience with this whatsoever, but we had a radio, and Tokyo rose. And for those of you who do not know about Tokyo Rose, Tokyo Rose was a woman who broadcast from Japan with propaganda trying to destroy the morale of the American soldiers. I don't really know whether she was an American or a British or what she was, but at any rate she was a, a traitorous person. She came on our radio and she said, BD-244, which was the name of our barge, Derek, BD-244, welcome to Tacloban. We're glad that you had a good trip, but that's the end of your good trip because look up in the air and you'll see something coming through the sky, which is a present from Japan. We looked up in the sky and here comes a couple of uh, uh, what were they called? They were Japanese zeros? Zeros. Yeah, Japanese zeros. A couple of Japanese zeros came over, made a pass over the top of us when we were in the harbor there at Tagloban. Our anti aircraft came out and blasted away, didn't hit them. They didn't drop anything. It was just all psychological. But she knew that BD-244 was in Tacloban Harbor. And she was going to scare the pants of us, off of us, and she succeeded, particularly when those two planes appeared. But uh, it was all psychological. Well, I got a, I, I backed up on my story. I was up in Manila, 
And uh, we were we stayed in Manila for uh, a few days, and then they wanted they shipped us down to another port called Batangas. And again, an, a seagoing tug came and towed us down to Batangas, which was about a hundred miles south of Manila, but which was a big, big port and a big harbor. And uh, we went down there and our job was to unload tanks and bulldozers from ships. And the, the biggest thing that we ever had to unload was a tugboat. We actually had to, a tugboat that had been sent over from the States that they needed over there was sitting on the deck of this freighter and we had to get up there and get a hold of that tugboat and lift it off and put it down in the water. And we were the only thing in the South Pacific that could lift that tugboat. So uh, we were very, very important. And we didn't see anything more of any zeros. Uh, nobody ever shot at me in, in anger. But we unloaded ship after ship after ship. And the stuff that we unloaded went up into the northern part of uh, Luzon, which is where the major fighting was taking place. I, Ten okay. minutes. I need to take a drink. Oh, okay. You want to turn it on? It was not bad being in Batangas. Uh, we had a lot of USO people who came by and uh, put on entertainment for us because it was quite a big port and there was a lot of activity in that general area. We, uh, we had a, a group of Filipinos who were working for us. As a matter of fact, I had 34 Filipinos uh, toward the end. I had a couple of promotions there, was promoted to buck sergeant and then finally to staff sergeant. And my job as staff sergeant, I was in charge of the crane. And I had 34 Filipinos working for me and 14 soldiers. And pretty soon the war was over. We were very happy, I'm sure. I don't remember very much about the day that we actually heard the announcement. And I really don't remember very much about what happened with the atomic bombs dropping. But we were sure glad that the war was over after the war was over, we uh, continued to be in Batangas. Things slowed down. We did not have any more tanks or bulldozers to unload. Uh, but we did have uh, some cargo that we had to unload because the troops were stationed there in the Philippines for quite a long time afterwards. And they had to be supported with all kinds of supplies and equipment. We were uh, happy to hear that MacArthur had returned to the Philippines as promised and that the campaign had been successful and that the Japanese had decided that they had enough. We were over there for six or eight months after that and then uh, finally it was time to come home. The time that you had to come home was based on how many months of service you had had. The trip back home was uh, peaceful and exciting. It was on a nice troop ship, not a kind of a ship that we went over on. And I was uh, very glad to get back home. Decided someplace along the line because of my work on that crane that I wanted to be an engineer. I applied to RPI for engineering school and was told that the class was filled because I was applying too late. Having already been accepted at Albany State before I had gone in the service, that seemed the logical thing to do. I started at Albany State thinking I would transfer to RPI and become an engineer. but. Uh, I found that education was my forte and I, I just stuck with that. The, the Army service certainly was a maturing experience for any young person, not only me but uh, anybody else who went in at the age of 18. 
I guess we were proud that we were able to help our country and that we felt that we had done our duty and that it was now time to go to college. Fortunately, we had a GI Bill and I was lucky enough to win a couple of scholarships uh, so that I was able to go to college almost free. And I'm sure that my Army experience helped me a great deal when I went to college because when you go to college at uh, 24 or 23 instead of at 18, the maturity makes a big difference. And there were many servicemen with us, and we all uh, used to talk about the times that we had in the service, but I'm sure that they made us better students. Well, thank you for serving our country and for doing this interview.